Graham, and thank you for the opportunity to present to the IWPC. It's a, an honor. <clears throat> so uh, again, I'm representing Conrad Technologies, and the topic today is advances in sensor fusion XIL to accelerate autonomous vehicle compute platform validation. And uh, my, a little bit of uh, background on Conrad Technologies. We were founded in 1993 by Michael Conrad, where Global Headquarters is based in Radolfsfeld, Germany. Uh, we have uh, between 250 and 300 employees, and we have uh, offices uh, throughout the globe uh, supporting our customers. I am based in our U.S. headquarters, which is just out outside of Detroit, Michigan. Um, I am personally based in Ohio. Um, just a little bit of personal background on me. I have a PhD in analytical chemistry, uh, but then spent the first 20 years of my career with National Instruments in various business development and account manager roles. And for the last four years, I've been with uh, Conrad Technologies, uh, uh, selling to the North America and uh, uh, really the entire America's accounts, primarily uh, with uh, a focus on these ADAS applications. Conrad is very tightly uh, associated with NI or National Instruments. Uh, we have some of the best uh, LabVIEW and test and software developers in the world. Uh, so our uh, solutions are generally speaking based on National Instruments software uh, and as much NI hardware as is relevant, but we also integrate in uh, other technologies uh, as well. We are very uh, collaborative in our, in our solution development. Uh, we work, of course, primarily with NI, but we also have our founding member of the ADAS IIT consortium, which is, uh, brings together expertise in a variety of different domains uh, to, to tackle uh, vertical uh, challenges in this area. And this is just a partial list of the partnerships that we uh, work with. We're always very open to additional partnerships so if there's anyone on the line that would like to explore one with us, I'm happy to follow up with you later. When you look at the NI ecosystem and a partner ecosystem for NI, uh, people often wonder, well, where, where does Conrad fit into that? We are one of a handful of uh, NI uh, certified uh, vehicle radar test system integrators. So we deliver both validation, uh, HIL, and production test systems for testing automotive radars. We're also just more generically one of their uh, certified RF and wireless uh, specialty partners, and this gets into some of the technologies relevant to connected car, for, for example. Um, last year, NI made a major financial investment in Conrad Technologies, uh, primarily to uh, co-develop their data record AD and AD replay solutions. And so uh, the products that have been released to market and are in, will be coming to market in the near future um, are co-developed uh, by INI and Conrad Engineering uh, for this, this particular market space. We'll talk a little bit about that later in the presentation. And uh, just generically speaking, we, we offer lots of solutions based on, on LabVIEW, as I already mentioned. Looking specifically at ADAS, um, our test capabilities are quite broad. Uh, we work with the companies that manufacture the ADAS sensors to do both validation and production testing. And we do this under a variety of conditions and we do it for really all of the relevant sensors. Uh, so we can test any of these sensors uh, under temperature and humidity control, for example, uh, with appropriate optical or RF transparent windows uh, to contain the, contain the DUT in a, in a thermal chamber, uh, but uh, allowing the, the system to be tested. Uh, and then we have quite a bit of automation experience to allow us to either, um, you know, align and assemble uh, automotive cameras uh, in, a, in a highly automated way uh, or to test radar sensors in a very automated way, uh, et cetera. So this is a, um, just a, a few examples. This is a uh, radar sensor uh, enclosure. Uh, with a RF transparent window that we can use to do uh, RF or radar sensor testing under temperature and thermal control. Uh, this is a, a short video of a uh, automotive camera assembly, uh, an alignment test system that we've put together. 
uh, some of our production radar test systems, and uh, this is our one of our validation uh, radar chambers that we've delivered to customers. Just a little sub sampling of the types of solutions we do, we, we get involved in for ADAS test. <coughs> uh, we also focus quite a bit on object simulation. You'll hear a lot more about this uh, throughout the presentation, but uh, we can simulate radar objects, we can project uh, images in front of uh, automotive cameras or do direct injection of camera data into the ECU. We can emulate LIDAR sensors and, and incorporate LIDAR into HIL systems. Uh, we have an ultrasonic sensor simulator, and we have partners that we work with to implement VDAX uh, emulation as well. And so uh, what we'll spend a lot of our time today talking about then is the ADAS XIL space and then its connection into the ADAS record and replay space. Uh, last year, we received Frost and Sullivan's Best Practices Award specifically for our sensor fusion HIL testing capability. So my uh, proposed agenda for today is to uh, give you a brief overview of what the state of the, the art for ADAS and AD, AD testing, uh, talk about the role of simulation in that, uh, ADAS XIL components of a system that uh, could be mixed and matched in a modular fashion, and then some considerations about when to pursue a, a particular strategy versus another. Uh, then we'll spend a little bit of time looking at a few of the different specific sensor technologies and how we would test those. Uh, and then we'll conclude with, uh, with you know, talking about sensor fusion XIL in a more focused way and in in its connection to record and replay. I think this might be a good opportunity to pause, Graham, to see if there's any questions or comments or if there are any topics on this list that people are particularly interested in. Yeah, that's a great idea, uh, Jeff. So let's let's extend that question to the to the audience and say, you know, if there are specific areas you would like to hear about, drop it in the chat box. And as we're going forward, I'll keep an eye on that and uh, I'll interrupt uh, Jeff as 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 we as I need to to uh, to answer those. Quick question from me, Jeff. Actually, um, you know, we. <laughs> If I look back and think about when the whole ADAS movement started, you know, um, radar kicked off and then, and then we started to see a lot of activity around cameras and, and LIDAR kicking in. And then as, we, as we're moving towards, you know, autonomous vehicles being quite topical, uh, as they have been for a while. Um, what are you seeing from your partners and customers? Sorry about that. Uh, in terms of the... Um, in terms of the, uh, the, the, the move towards autonomy. Are you seeing people, let's say in retail markets, backing off and going more towards a highly automated um, active safety system or is autonomy still flavor of the month in terms of hype? Yeah, boy, I'm not sure I'm in a position to make a, a broad market analysis of that. Uh, certainly the customers that I deal with directly are all across that spectrum. We have uh, you know, customers that are focusing just on L2, uh, you know, drive assist capability. And then we have uh, some customers who are going all in on full autonomy. And, and I'm not sure I've seen a whole lot of trends. I've, I've read about people, uh, you know, some analysis of that, that I just I haven't been able to independently validate. Um, but we are seeing uh, uh, continued interest and expanding interest in these technologies and what the customers' ultimate objectives with them are and on what time. I'm not sure I have uh, any more insight than someone else on that. Yeah, okay, well, great, thanks. thanks. I, I think that's the point though, isn't it? It's like, you know, there are so many ways that this could go and, and we're still in a position where we don't really, uh, really know which, which what's gonna be the real sweet spot or whatever, so right, yeah, thank, right. thanks for that. Certainly, I mean, the one thing you can say uh, is that the whole challenge is, is consistently proven to be more uh, more formidable than than wasn't was believed, right? I think that the more we develop and the more that we test, the more that we realize that we have more that we need to do. And I think <laughs> yeah. that, uh, that that is, I don't think there would be too much pushback on that point. But uh, <laughs> having said that, the technology is advancing uh, in a pretty impressive way. So uh, you know that trade off point, I think, and, and certainly the the environment in which the vehicle is, is asked to operate uh, is, is a significant thing too. For those of us that live in the Midwest United States, uh, the prospect of driving in some of that weather autonomously is a little bit uh, 
hard to imagine. Uh, whereas, you know, uh, San Francisco, Austin, those sorts of areas, I can, you know, envision it a little bit more easily. So. Great. Hey, thanks. And I'll just remind everybody, if there are any particular topics on here that you want to hear about, uh, or if you have questions at any time, feel free to ask them and we'll interrupt uh, uh, Jeff as we go along. Great. Thanks. Okay, Jeff, thanks very much. So <clears throat> I've, I've put on this slide just three different types of testing that we often see for testing uh, either ADAS systems or autonomous systems. <clears throat> I can, if we break them up into buckets of what I'll call pure simulation or software in the loop. Uh, in this case, we're running embedded software algorithms in a virtual environment on a PC. So the customer's perception, planning, and control algorithms are being run on a PC uh, with simulation data. Um, the benefits of this are that the scenarios are parameterized in an almost infinitely variable way. Uh, we get test coverage of any arbitrary scenario just by uh, changing the software parameters. Uh, but the challenge is there that even the most uh, hi-fi uh, simulation can't capture all the nuances of the real world. Uh, and it can be difficult to train some of the perception algorithms with this data. Uh, and, and sometimes, uh, you know, challenges in an ADAS system come down to synchronization and timing issues among the different sensors in the system. And that can be difficult to model properly. Uh, in a pure simulation environment. So these are just some of the strengths and weaknesses. This is not intended to be exhaustive at all, um, but, but pure simulation is gonna play a, a more and more uh, uh, significant part in everybody's testing strategy. I think that's probably safe to say. Um, record and replay is, is a very exciting technology for us. Uh, here we're talking about high bandwidth, synchronized data logging of the raw vehicle sensor data as well as object data reported out from intermediate ECUs and metadata associated with uh, you know, the, the vehicle um, the, or the traffic situation. Um, and then on the, the replay side, it's then analysis, either just for human review of the data uh, was the terminology we, take, we tend to use within Conrad, and then also uh, replay of data to ver verify sensor performance uh, typically injecting the data back into an ECU in an HIL context. Um, and the same data can be used to uh, test ADAS functionality or train machine learning uh, algorithms. Um, the benefit here, of course, is the record and re recorded data is real-world data uh, and by definition provides the highest fidelity. The challenge, of course, is it's expensive to acquire that data. It's difficult to acquire that data. And uh, for the most interesting i.e. dangerous scenarios, uh, it can be very challenging to get that data without putting someone or, or some property at risk. Um, and then uh, certainly relative to pure simulation, you have fewer options in parameterizing your data. You can't uh, make it rain on command or you can't uh, you know, tell the deer to run faster or those sorts of things uh, very easily. Um, and then if we look at the kind of the middle ground, which I'll call HIL testing. Uh, here we're using real-time simulation environment to test the embedded software that's actually running on a production or barely you know, pre-production ECU. Um, we do have, in this case, uh, the data coming in from a simulation environment. Uh, so we do still have the, the flexibility of parameterization of the data. Uh, so we get excellent test coverage. Uh, and we also have the timing issues uh, in play because now we're working with sensor data that's synchronized and uh, is injected into the actual ECU so we can we can fully model the, the timing issues. Uh, but here again, we still have limitations on the fidelity of our simulations and uh, the test throughput, the number of tests per hour or whatever that you can implement is less than a pure simulation environment. Any questions on this or comments? No, I don't think so right now. Jeff, keep All going, right. my friend. Moving move right along. All right. So if we look at where we are now, um, I think that in the, you know, the, these, these box sites are arbitrary, but um, we're definitely in a situation where we're evolving more from uh, uh, you know, primarily field-based testing and HIL testing into a situation where this, the pure software testing is, needs to play 
a larger role in order to get to these higher levels of autonomous. And if we look at you know what is being done in each of these areas currently, uh, we're logging largely the network data, the CAN bus object lists, uh, for example. Uh, and we're using REST bus uh, data for the HIL uh, implementation, and uh, we're doing timing agnostic testing in the SIL environment. And where we need to go uh, as an industry to be able to test these technologies is higher fidelity data recording, not just the object data, but now the raw sensor data. Uh, and we want to use the field testing primarily for the, just the final validation uh, of the system or even uh, fleet logging from field from vehicles that, are, that have been uh, deployed. Um, for HIL, we're now uh, looking at do injecting the, the, the raw sensor data directly into the ECU. Uh, we're combining that with the over-the-air sensor emulation we've been doing for the last several years uh, and doing this high-fidelity simulation and replay. And then in software, we're really going to be using this at all stages of development. Uh, we're going to try to implement timing uh, where possible and simulation where possible and uh, do a lot of parameterized uh, corner case testing uh, of the most difficult sensor fusion challenges or um, uh, any perception planning and control <coughs> issues that um, need to be thoroughly vetted. Uh, we need to do those in a high fidelity simulation environment. So, you know, mapping these onto the, you know, V diagram that I think is familiar for, for many of us, uh, we look at uh, this XIL concept. Uh, all the way through the design and validation uh, process. We find ourselves working with pure software techniques on the set left side of the v, v for model in the loop, software in the loop. <clears throat> and then as we uh, reach the apex of the V, we've got the, the hardware in the loop where we're now bringing in the, uh, the actual ECUs. Uh, for an ADAS system, then we might consider bringing the driver into the loop to make sure that they're getting the proper uh, uh, sensory feedback, uh, seeing what their reactions are, whether they can uh, respond to the cues from the ADAS system uh, and so forth, get that overall driver experience. And then uh, we may even bring in uh, part or all of the vehicle in the loop uh, to capture this, the braking system, the steering system, et cetera, uh, as part of the overall driver experience. So, as we think specifically about where simulations role is going to be in testing, I think that uh, many, many uh, in the industry believe that we need to get to a scenario where we're doing almost all of our testing in simulation. And, and some companies are closer to this goal already than others. The ones that are not at this location are, are, are have typically have corporate goals to get to this point, uh, but we want to use simulation for as much as possible. It's certainly the least expensive and highest velocity uh, of testing and can cover you know, every possible scenario uh, in principle. And then we can use the HIL uh, functional test and, and replay data uh, to, uh, to, for, for testing out those specific scenarios. Uh, and, and then uh, again, road test and data recording uh, should you know, not necessarily decreases an absolute amount, but decreases a percentage of what we're doing. So when we look at the components of uh, what could go into an EDS XIL system, uh, there's quite a variety and really every system that we uh, implement for a customer is, is different from ones we've done previously. It's all very modular. It's all based on the same commercial off the shelf technology from NI and other instrument vendors and so forth. Uh, but there are a number of different uh, implementations. For example, uh, if we're testing uh, the radar over the air, we're going to use radar object emulation with the NIVRTS, for example. Or if we're doing uh, uh, camera testing, at least historically, uh, that involves mounting a, a, a you know, camera in front of a projection screen in a you know, controlled lighting environment. Uh, and, and presenting it with simulation of the point of view of that camera uh, and just you know pulling that into the optics of the of the camera and into the system that way. 
uh, as we'll see, this is actually becoming less significant over time as uh, uh, there's actually uh, direct injection is usually a better way to do this unless the optics need to be in the loop for something specific to the test. Um, we also are able to now uh, emulate ultrasonic sensors for testing primarily of automated parking functionality. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, LiDAR object emulation uh, is certainly something that we are doing uh, with, with select customers. It is uh, by the nature of the beast, since every LiDAR is technologically unique, um, we need to uh, implement custom solutions on a kind of ongoing project-based way with, with our customers to implement these solutions. Uh, what you're looking at there is a picture of a letter tech LiDAR uh, that we did for a very early proof of concept uh, for this. This was in 2016. Uh, but we are we have several active projects for LiDAR technology. It's just uh, hard to generalize those um, as, as, again, the rotating LiDARs, MEMS LiDARs, FMCW LiDARs, et cetera. The technologies that you're working with are going to be different on each project. And then, as we, I mentioned earlier, we have um, uh, partners, SEA in this example that we work with, uh, if we need to emulate VDX data into a simulation. And so we can combine these systems in a variety of different ways. Uh, and this is just uh, some pictures of some of the systems that we've deployed. So um, I'm going to skip through most of these slides just for the interest of time. This is just basically walks, I'll leave them in the PDF so that you can look at them later. But basically, uh, if we look at you know, the the sensor to ECU chain, uh, we, we typically have that external world. We have sensors looking at the external world. Those then uh, provide their data to some sort of uh, sensor ECU. Uh, and then there's a network bus connection inside the vehicle to a sensor fusion ECU. Uh, and then uh, that is, is then in, in the overall vehicle uh, network to, topography somewhere. Um, there are obviously different strategies uh, in terms of distributing the, the ECUs or centralizing them that I don't have time to go into today. Um, but if we just think generically about uh, data recording, uh, at this point we can log either the data prior to the sensor ECU uh, as the raw sensor data, GMSL2, FPD link, uh, those sorts of things, uh, or we can log the object lists or, you know, uh, reduced data uh, provided out outside from the output of the sensor ECU. We can typically run a log both of those uh, in a data recording environment. Hey, Jeff. Yep. So um, similar sort of question, I guess, to, to what I asked earlier, because like you, I'm seeing people taking different strategies, you know, different perspectives on distributed or central, um, 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 you know, uh, uh, systems. Um, are you are you seeing it, any particular preference or or direction, or you're seeing it going going both ways? Is the first question, and then the second question is: Are you seeing any coordination or commonality with regards to the uh, what's being used for the network bus? Yeah, so we're definitely seeing uh, the rise of automotive Ethernet, um, both at the uh, 100 base T1 and 1,000 base T1 levels, uh, those are being used uh, often for the LIDAR data in particular, as well as some of the radar data, these you know, modern radar. Um, we are seeing uh, on the camera side a, a pretty good standardization between FPD link and GMSL, uh, probably equal distributions of customers using each of those technologies, roughly speaking. Uh, and then you've got kind of the, the, the maybe Maybe obvious, but to me it's kind of obvious. Market forces driving the uh, the centralization versus the decentralization. I think that um, a lot of the OEMs, uh, knowing that they're ultimately on the hook for the safety of the driving experience, uh, want to uh, centralize a lot of the sensor data uh, so that they can uh, work with the raw data uh, and test the raw data as much as possible. Uh, rather than having to black box it to their supply chain. Uh, and then on the, on the flip side of that, a lot of the tier ones, especially those with differentiated IP, uh, are very keen to keep the, the, the sensor ECUs in play 
uh, where they can apply their differentiated capability and then pass out a, a, a useful list of, of object data and so forth. And there's a lot of supplier uh, trust issues there, a lot of uh, you know legal arrangements and so forth that I don't have any visibility into, but uh, we still see quite a bit of, of both um, yeah, I'm sh I'm sure, I'm sure, and like you say, it you know people will go may maybe in in different directions, but that that bus uh, will be pretty important depending on how things uh, pan out, I guess. Yep. And then this slide is just kind of the the inverse of the previous is for the data direct injection or an HIL context, we're taking the data that we've you know logged or stored uh, or simulated, and and we're now passing it out through the same connections just in the opposite direction uh, to the back into the system uh, in an HIL context. We'll talk more about this later, but I'm not going to dwell on this. But if we look at XIL in particular, and we're considering some of the strengths or, or challenges associated with each of them, um, the high fidelity sensor injection, you know, taking the raw data from GMSL2 or FPD link or, uh, or the pure you know, Ethernet stream, uh, from a from a lidar, for example, um, allows you to get physics-based raw sensor data injection from, for example, a GPU processor uh, in real time with real time closed loop response at the full frame rate of the system, and that's uh, very powerful in a, in an XIL context. Uh, the challenge is, of course, from the simulation software environment uh, uh, point of view is that modeling those sensors uh, in, a, in, a, in a software tool uh, is very complex. You have to rebuild the physics from first principles. You have to account for multi-path signals and, and, and interferences. You have to account for the material properties of uh, the surfaces that you're, you're simulating in the, in the world and in the, and, and the optical capabilities of the sensor, uh, in the case of optical sensors. And then uh, you also have to uh, emulate the what's typically I squared C protocol uh, uh, communication that would be in place uh, often with uh, encryption, in fact, uh, uh, between the uh, sensor and the ECU. And that actually is uh, extremely challenging. It has to be uh, reverse engineered in some cases or involve a, a pretty tight collaboration with the tier one or the or even the maximum TI. Uh, to get this uh, get this correct, so it's a, it's a challenging uh, area. Uh, it's one that we're getting more and more experience with, but um, it's it can be very tricky. Uh, but when you are successful, uh, it allows you to get uh, successful sensor fusion of, from multiple sensor domains, and uh, this can be extremely powerful in an HIL context. Uh, but this can, unless your your focus and your test is 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 heavy on the perception side, uh, that may be overkill for what's needed in a particular test scenario. And what we find is that the object level HIL, the over-the-air sensor testing, uh, or an ideal sensor testing where you're even just using object lists, uh, this is, is much more straightforward to execute, and it can be very, it, it, in many cases, is sufficient for testing plenty control systems. Just again, with the caveat that perception is, is a different monster. And then this slide is just, um, uh, we work often with, with NI Monodrive uh, as one of the simulation uh, software tools that we support. And this is just, I, I find the slide helpful because it kind of shows very quickly the types of parameterization can be done in software with, you know, the switch of a configuration flag uh, in, in the software tool is you can change the weather, you know, instantaneously. And so if you're testing a particular features performance uh, in rain, fog, snow, Slippery pavement, et cetera, uh, that can be, you know, done immediately in software, which obviously in, in uh, the real world is not so straightforward. Okay, so I want to spend uh, a few minutes then just kind of talking through the state of the art in testing three of the most common types of sensors: radar, camera, and ultrasonic. Um, you know, we've had several uh, IOQC presentations. Uh, in the past on this general topic, so I'm not going to go into detail. I'm just going to kind of highlight some of the evolution uh, since the last time Conrad presented uh, on this topic. So uh, this is kind of the, the timeline of radar evolution. 
uh, as we've moved to different frequencies for the radar. Obviously, we've needed to uh, modify the instrumentation that we've used for the radar object emulation. Uh, and then uh, the latest uh, VRTS systems typically are going to have a 4 gigahertz instantaneous bandwidth. Uh, and this is going to allow for uh, tighter uh, resolution of, uh, of objects in the, in the field of view in terms of distance resolution. Um, the challenges that our customers are exploring with the radar test systems are quite broad. Some of the things that we see our customers interested in is, uh, you know, what are the effects of the material properties of the bumpers or fascia or the you know, paint after they install the sensor uh, in a vehicle? They want to, you know, validate that the sensor data is still uh, still correctly reporting the environment uh, under those conditions. Uh, there's a lot of timing issues that, that our customers want to explore uh, in terms of synchronization with other sensor data. Um, and, and we want to be able to kind of tweak the phasing of the simulation signals to make sure that they're uh, fault tolerant uh, in various cases. Um, customers often want to simulate multiple objects on multiple angles of arrival. Uh, this can get quite technologically involved and expensive uh, beyond a, a certain minimum threshold. We typically see uh, two objects at two angles of arrival as being kind of the, the maximum uh, that a budget will typically tolerate, um, although we do have the technological ability to do multiple objects beyond that. Uh, but often a customer just needs to you know, validate the minimum angular separation between two, two objects in a particular field of view. Uh, they're just qualifying their sensors or something like that. And it's actually a relatively low cost system in that situation. Um, we, you know, other, other use cases for, for sensor emulation uh, is integrating uh, these uh, real world sensor data into uh, a virtual test drive and software environment like IPG CarMaker, for example. Um, uh, and, and, uh, Sorry, the slide's a little bit, a little bit uh, nonlinear here, but the, we already talked about the four gigahertz simultaneous bandwidth. Okay, so uh, when we're doing systems that involve radar, the VRTS gives us this over-the-air radar simulation. In which case, the the radar sensor is going to uh, generate its chirp. We're going to receive it uh, through a millimeter wave radio head. Uh, we're going to uh, digitize it, delay it, regenerate it with an appropriate uh, uh, phase shift, uh, attenuation, uh, Doppler, uh, appropriate for an object of a particular radar cross-section at a particular distance, and pass that back to the radar sensor. And then that sensor is just going to receive the, the output from the radar, as it always would, um, into the sensor fusion uh, or radar ECU. The other way that, that this product, product, this can be approached is what we call direct injection, where we're now uh, bringing, you know, again, this depends on, this, on the radar sensor, but if it's got a FPD link or GMSL uh, interface to it, we can bring the data directly uh, into uh, the ECU. And then the other, other way of approaching the uh, radar sensor data is just to use REST bus simulation uh, to uh, provide the object list to the ECU uh, simulating the result of the radar sensor. Obviously, this is going to give you no information about the performance of the radar itself. It's kind of an ideal radar situation in that uh, you're, you're assuming the radar is working completely optimally uh, and you're testing other aspects of the system. In terms of software simulation of radar, uh, this is just a, a slide that uh, was provided by uh, my colleagues at, at Monodrive. Uh, this just shows what's kind of state-of-the-art capable uh, for emulating uh, radar uh, data in software simulation. If we look at hardware-based emulation for radar signals, this is the the, some of the different configurations that we uh, deploy the, the, the VRTS uh, uh, instrumentation. These are kind of the three 
probably most most common scenarios or variations on these themes is on a collinear axis we can emulate uh, multiple and multiple objects on a single angle arrival this could be useful for emulating for example a motorcycle in front of a truck uh, etc this requires uh, nothing particular in the case of mechatronics and is actually relatively low cost to implement uh, and then uh, we can do two independent angles of arrival uh, now we're talking about needing to move the radio head in front of the uh, radar sensor and uh, this goes to get a little bit more uh, involved in terms of the mechatronics involved that, that required uh, but you can uh, uh, some customers are okay with just manually moving the second object relative to the first because uh, they're doing more static measurements. But if you're doing a scenario HIL implementation, you need to have mechatronics here to move them. And again, you can still do multiple objects along the same object angle of arrival with the addition of a little bit more hardware. And so this four objects on two angles of arrival is kind of the maximum practical uh, complexity for this type of set setup for most of our customers. This is just a, a picture, I showed a smaller version of this earlier, of one of our um, uh, single angle arrival systems. Uh, this one, I think, had two objects on a single angle arrival. Here you can see that this radar sensor is mounted on a dual axis rotation stage. It's right behind the Conrad logo here in the left picture uh, inside the, the RF anechoic chamber. And then on the left side of this uh, larger portion of the of the system would be the millimeter wave radio head and then in this uh, enclosure over here would be the NIPXI instrumentation uh, so it's all very uh, efficiently packed it's a it's on a mobile system it's actually um, we've had customers move this around uh, to different facilities uh, shared among different groups uh, this is just a, a typical uh, system you know roughly uh, you know quarter million dollars for a system like this um, one of the benefits of the, the NIVRTS platform is it allows you to do uh, object scenarios and measurements on the same platform. Again, I won't go into the details of this. It's all available uh, publicly online. Um, but uh, it does allow you to do both the, uh, the simulation and the, and the measurements in the same platform. Okay. Um, any questions on the radar-specific technology before we move on to cameras? No, I think we're good, Jeff. Thank you. All right. Okay, so uh, when we're testing camera systems, uh, what we're seeing, uh, the kind, of the kind of the main challenges facing the market right now is dealing with the increased number of cameras. And I guess I could probably put the resolution and bandwidth of those cameras as being kind of related challenges. You get an overall throughput issue uh, with the amount of data that you're, you're throwing around the vehicle. And then the, the, from the software side, uh, simulating uh, the input into a camera optically, you know, uses typically a high performance gaming engine as well as some physics based modeling of the, of the world and uh, is very, very uh, uh, challenging situation. But there are several players in the market right now, um, Hexagon, uh, NI, Monodrive, uh, ANSYS, IPG, all of them are, are and, and others are tackling these uh, very, uh, very effectively. Um, here again, I, I'm not going to go into all the details here, but we have choices in terms of whether we're going to put the camera in the loop over the air, just basically project in front of a screen, or whether we're going to take the optics out of the equation entirely uh, and project the, uh, well, I shouldn't say that the, the optics put the optics into the model uh, and bring that into the ECU as a uh, simulation uh, using now the direct camera bus, which would be a GMSL2 or FPD Link 3, or again, as we're starting to migrate to GMSL3 and FPD Link 4, but uh, basically a TI or, or Maxim based uh, interface. Um, although it is still uh, an option to just, uh, for the more straightforward test scenarios, uh, just provide the, the um, you know, object lists, for example, uh, corresponding to what would be generated by, for example, a mobile IECU uh, into an into a hill system. That would also be a, a situation we see. 
Um, here again, this is another slide I've borrowed from, from Monodrive, uh, just talking about how they have uh, evolved their uh, camera emulation capabilities and uh, encourage you to uh, follow up with me and, and, and with NI Monodrive and, and the other sensor vendors to see what the state of the art is uh, in this area. Um, historically, we've built a lot of camera theater boxes, for lack of a better word. Uh, this is still something that we use, uh, especially for forward-facing cameras, where uh, it can be challenging to kind of get between the sensor and the ECU, uh, just through IP considerations or, or technical challenge or a combination of both. Um, but this does have some limitations. Uh, the, one of the main strengths that it has is it's very low cost. Um, can be done for you know a couple you know 20 to 40k depending on the size of this system that you need to to, to put in place um, but it does have uh, limitations uh, in terms of, especially when you're dealing with uh, nighttime driving scenarios uh, the you know theater experience with with the video on a screen is just uh, nowhere near the same uh, optical experience as as what will be faced in a, in a you know, dark nighttime driving uh, experience with oncoming traffic and so forth. So that's where the we're seeing the the direct injection uh, scenarios being driven quite a bit by the need to test at nighttime driving conditions, especially with like adaptive headlamps and and these these other sorts of uh, beam steering and those sorts of things that we're seeing these days uh, with with headlamps. But this just shows the the more straightforward uh, camera object simulation capability. We've talked already about the fact that most of the uh, automotive cameras in the market are some variation on these TI or, 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 or Maxim uh, chipset serializer, deserializer. Uh, basically the camera, uh, the direct interface off the camera is this MIPI CSI2 LVDS signal uh, that then goes into the serializer, which is then uh, robust for longer distances uh, and uh, very high performance, you know, three to, three to four G gigabits per second and then it uh, on the device side on the ECU side then it will encounter a deserializer uh, and be converted back into uh, MIPI CSI2 into the ECU. So NI uh, about a year and a half ago released some very nice interface cards uh, for uh, interfacing with both FBD link and GMSL uh, interfaces, these support power over coax, as well as the uh, I squared C and GPIO uh, back channel communication that's required. All of these uh, cards from NI are uh, uh, FPGA enabled, uh, so we can uh, edit the personalities of these cards in the Labby FPGA environment, which is uh, almost always necessary for some of these applications uh, because of the specific camera. Uh, configuration and communication requirements, especially these, you know, I squared C and GPIO handshaking uh, and 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 sanity checks that are occurring uh, throughout the uh, acquisition process to make sure that it's a legitimate uh, camera signal. These cards can be configured in a variety of different use cases. Uh, you know, we won't talk here about camera functional tests. Uh, but we, you know, all of the other configurations, the vehicle recording, closed loop hill, open loop data replay are all uh, things that we're, we're seeing. Um, any questions about camera based testing? Oh, we'll come back to that as we get to the full sensor fusion. Yeah, let's keep moving. Uh, Jeff. All right. Thanks. Pressing on here. Okay. So uh, here's another uh, slide that I borrowed from, from the Monodrive folks on how to mo model ultrasonic sensors in, in, uh, in, their, in simulation software. Again, some of the considerations and some of the, the factors involved. Uh, with our customers, we tend to take a, uh, often just take a uh, approach very similar to what we do with the VRTS, the radar test system, is we have uh, uh, a compact Rio, NI compact Rio based tool that actually uses the customer's parking ECU and sensor suite uh, to simulate ultrasonic sensor data uh, around the vehicle for, again, testing of automated parking. Uh, the way that this works is we just have the, uh, the, the parking ECU. Uh, we'll get REST bus communication from the system to tell it to uh, activate the, the ultrasonic sensors. 
those sensors will uh, emit their standard, you know, chirps or waveforms. We will uh, use another pair, another set of sensors paired with with each of these uh, uh, ultrasonics to capture those uh, signals. We will then use the FPGA on the NI instrument to uh, again delay, attenuate, otherwise, you know, reproduce the re the reflected signal or the regenerated signal corresponding to an object at a particular distance uh, from that ultrasonic sensor. And we'll send that back to the, to the sensor. It'll be received just as if it was a normal uh, uh, real reflection and it will be processed by the ECU. So this is just object emulation, very analogous to what we do with radar at a much lower price point. Um, <clears throat> and we can bring this uh, into an ADAS ECU system uh, or ADAS Hill system, excuse me, uh, as a uh, object simulation environment. Typical um, for an entire suite of, of 12, let's say, ultrasonic sensors, we can usually do this, these types of systems for about $150,000 or less. Okay, so last two topics are sensor fusion test and data recording. And uh, this just basically pulls together a lot of things we've already talked about is um, if we look at, um, Data injection. If we imagine having, uh, you know, on the on the right side and, and uh, of the slide, apologies, going right to left, kind of intuitively backwards to me. But <clears throat> we're taking recorded data or simulation data uh, from any of the popular uh, simulation environments uh, on the market, whether it's Hexagon or IPG, Ansys or NI um, or CarSim or Scanner. Uh, all of these tools, <clears throat> we can work with any of them. Um, but basically, uh, you'll have maybe a, another layer of software doing the test case management, something like a Fortelix environment uh, or a uh, Tracetronics. Uh, but anyhow, we've, we've got the test case management, the configuration, the user experience, uh, the simulation uh, scenarios are generated here. Uh, and then uh, we have the data is then presented through typically an NIPXI environment uh, through uh, you know over the air technologies, direct injection technologies, V to X technologies, uh, et cetera. So everything that we've been talking about up to now uh, can be incorporated into this sensor fusion XIL type environment. This is just another uh, picture kind of showing how uh, this can be can leverage uh, <clears throat> data and compute in the cloud uh, through a variety of different platforms. Um, again, this uh, shows uh, how the data can come either from a, uh, a, a live data recording system from an in-vehicle system or from the simulation environments. And again, the, the hardware that we use for the replay in HIL is identical regardless of whether the data is coming. Uh, from the real world or from simulation. If we look at, uh, generally speaking, what we're talking about with sensor fusion is just the general challenge of arbitrating uh, uh, different sensor inputs. If you get uh, corresponding data from both the camera and the radar, for example, uh, it's pretty straightforward about what the vehicle should do. But uh, if you're getting uh, disparate information from or conflicting information from the cameras or the radars, then your sensor fusion ECU needs to make some decisions. And these can be some of the more important uh, decisions about what to, what data to ignore, what, need, what data to believe, et cetera. And this is a, a critical part of the perception system of a vehicle. Okay. This is a, just kind of a repositioning of some stuff from previous slides. This is a model of a, of a system that we delivered to a customer uh, just to show kind of what's, what's possible uh, in, in, the, in the last couple of years is we now can build uh, stacks of compute, um, you know, just high performance PCs with high performance GUs uh, that give us simulation, simulated sensors. In this case, these are monodrive uh, simulated cameras uh, running, you know, this is a sensor model specific for the customer's uh, sensor. And uh, we're able to do 
you know, in this case, I think it was uh, roughly a dozen camera simulations along with uh, five or six radars and, uh, and a LIDAR emulation as well. And uh, the customer wanted, first of all, an SIL system in which the simulated sensor uh, data were presented uh, into another set of PCs that would model their perception, planning, and control. And uh, this is where uh, they had, you know, that we actually used HDMI uh, video capture cards in the perception systems to take the data straight out of the GPUs uh, from the monograph system. And then we used uh, ethernet uh, for the LIDAR and radar data. Um, and then they had another computer that was on their network for the planning control model that would interface with, uh, give updates to the monodrive state sensor compute that would then give the next uh, update to the sensor models on a hundred Hertz uh, cadence. So a hundred times a second, we're getting new state information uh, from the from the planning control system about where the vehicle is relative to the vehicle physics model. And we're simulating that new environment, passing it into the perception system and iterating through the system in a virtual drive. <coughs> Hopefully it makes sense. And then this system could be uh, interacting with uh, a driver in the loop system, for example. So oh, Jeff, there's a question here, yep. um, just uh, from Bob. What process of bandwidth is required for the systems? Yeah, this is something that we have to work through on a system by system basis. Yep. Uh, the higher the resolution, the cam cameras are the most demanding sensors in general. Um, and, and the resolution and frame rate of the camera uh, are going to uh, determine the compute requirement as well as the data interfacing requirement uh, for that sensor. So uh, typically, you know, uh, we can get uh, one or two or maybe three cameras uh, per PC with multiple high-performance GPUs. Um, it just depends, though. Uh, that, that's, and and we, we work quite a bit on, you know, looking at different vendors for the GPUs, uh, the, uh, the, the computes themselves, and then the, um, the interfacing, again, is, is dependent on the sensor suite. So this is something that we do in the design phase. Yeah, the and then he's asking here, is it standard GPUs you're using? I think you kind of answered that. I don't know if you... It is definitely standard gaming card, you know, yeah. Yeah. Uh, which, of course, has all the supply chain challenges that, that everyone's experiencing with, with those devices, but uh, and people using them for Bitcoin mining and other things that get in the way of <laughs> 8S sensor development. But, uh, but yeah, they're, they're, it's the exact same technology, and that makes them very low cost when you can find them. Yeah, great. Just a reminder to everybody, we've got about uh, five minutes left. So yep. if you have more questions, get them in quickly. <laughs> yep. Okay. So uh, again, this is the, the, the same system. Then we can start replacing the PCs with the actual 8S ECU for the perception planning and control. And now we're taking the same compute simulation sensors and now we're passing them into uh, a PXI environment where they are converted to GMSL or FPD link or automotive ethernet uh, or CAN bus, et cetera, signals, uh, potentially also with fault insertion on some of those signals for uh, hill test cases and so forth. And those are now brought directly into the ADAS ECU. And so this is the evolution. And this, this customer happened to purchase two systems from us. One was a pure SIL system. The other was a hill system and they can use the exact same compute stack to generate the data and do the testing in the, in the software environment as they do in the hardware environment. And this is the value of that common platform based on the NI uh, COTS hardware. Um, I'm gonna skip through these slides. They don't really tell us a whole lot of new information. These are just some pictures of some of the systems we've delivered to customers. This one is, incorporates an over-the-air camera simulation with the ultrasonic sensor simulation uh, this used, I believe, IPG CarMaker as a simulation environment. This is a system that we uh, sold into Asia uh, to one of their, I believe, national labs. This had uh, a couple of different radar over-the-air uh, uh, simulators as well as a core HIL system, a brake simulator and a steering simulator, as well as a camera simulator with driver-in-the-loop 
uh, uh, cockpit uh, capability. Uh, budget for the system, as you might imagine, was in the millions of dollars, um, and uh, you know, government facilities or large OEMs are pretty much the only ones that are usually investing in those those scale of systems. But, um, okay, last topic is ADAS record and replay. It's related to the Sensor Fusion XIL because the recorded data, as we discussed earlier, is the highest fidelity data, uh, and you typically need it at least as a sanity check for your simulations. So some of the challenges that we see with ADAS record is the, um, the non-standard rapidly evolving mixture of sensor types and data rates makes it difficult to purchase a system that's going to grow with your requirements. Uh, we see a lot of black box uh, data loggers on the market that have uh, vendor-defined I.O. capability. Uh, they also have vendor-defined GUIs, file formats, and operating system support. Uh, they very often provide limited opportunity for inline signal processing or on the replay side for fault injection. Um, they, Because they tend to be cobbled together from a variety of different in-house built tools, or third-party vendors. Uh, you often have poorly defined environmental specifications. So if you want to go driving these things in a high temperature or low temperature environment, it's hard to calculate how robust they will be. Um, and then on the record side, the timing, the triggering, the synchronization of multi-rate, multi-sensor data is always challenging. And similarly on the playback side, simultaneously regenerating that data with the proper uh, fidelity of, of what happened in the real world can be very challenging on the playback side. <clears throat> you run into absolute uh, limitations on performance in terms of aggregate data rates, uh, fixed amount of storage, et cetera. Uh, and then you have challenges of how to manage the data when you're done with it, or when you've acquired it. And then uh, sometimes the vendors of these black boxes are, are quite small and uh, you're, you have to take an organizational risk of depending on your building your platform on a, on a potentially volatile company. So in my last minute here, I'll just uh, highlight the fact that NI and Conrad Technologies have built a uh, solution capability on the NI Data Record AD. This is a PXI-based solution based on the full NI uh, suite of, of instrumentations for interfacing to all the different types of sensors. We've partnered with Seagate uh, as our preferred storage provider for removable uh, storage, which can be uh, implemented in a storage as a service context as needed, uh, which is quite effective for these types of environments. And then Conrad has developed a pre-label tool uh, that the drivers can also use, as, or the passengers of the vehicle can use to flag various traffic scenarios, weather conditions, uh, uh, objects along the road, et cetera, and log that data as metadata while they're driving. So uh, with that, uh, well, I'll just mention we also can build these into very rugged uh, enclosures. So with that, I will conclude my presentation. I think I went one minute over. Sorry about that. Uh, and here's my contact information. I would love to follow up with uh, other instrumentation vendors that may have uh, technologies that would be relevant to, to our systems. I would love to follow up with, of course, customers that might be interested in uh, pursuing some of this technology or even just uh, industry analysts or others that want to talk about the significance of them. Happy to follow up. Thank you very much, Jeff. Uh, really interesting. Um, I think you've just got a note from Mark Peter Altoff from Umla saying he'll reach out. <laughs> so so uh, sounds like uh, you've got a conversation to take place there. Okay. Wonderful. Um, Really good, very interesting. Thanks very much for that. Um, if anybody has any last questions, we're just over time, but um, I'm sure uh, Jeff won't mind if they come in and we can cover them quickly. Other than that, you're very welcome to raise them. And I know some people will be um, downloading the recording and maybe some questions come up at that point. So I would invite everybody to <clears throat> send their questions in. If they've got Jeff's information, which is on the screen now, that's fine. Alternatively, you're very welcome to come through IWPC and we'll push that through to Jeff uh, as, as, it, uh, as it comes in. Um, so thanks everybody for turning out. Um, Jeff, once again, a big thank you to you. Thank you very much for your informative uh, pitch. And um, we look forward to catching you and maybe some of the other guys on the call at a face-to-face -face session in the not too distant future. Wonderful.
Thanks, yeah, everybody. Thanks again for the opportunity. It's been it's been a pleasure. Appreciate it. Great. Thanks a lot, Jeff. Bye for now, everybody. Bye.